Dear all, welcome back to this second day of our second week of our school. We will continue with second lecture of this week with Dr. Juan Rafael Martinez Galarza, who is uh, helping us to understand and try to guide us through the X-ray Chandra observations and all the data. Juan Rafael, how are you? I'm doing good, Esteban. Thank you for having me on a second day. Hopefully by the end of the week, you will not be tired of seeing my face. Yeah, never. That will never happen. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, you have your slides already ready? Yeah. Okay. So uh, then let's uh, upload your slides here. You're not in the presentation mode yet. Now you're ready. So thank you very much, Juan Rafael, for accepting this invitation. And the space is yours. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining for a second lecture on x-ray uh, astronomy and astrostats and data science. Uh, I hope uh, yesterday's lecture was enjoyable. Uh, we had to rush a little bit at the end with the practical aspects of it, uh, just thinking of time. But today I'm going to try to leave some space at the end to complete that exercise from yesterday and then show you a little thing that uh, relates to what we're going to be talking uh, about today. So today's lecture, uh, it's about probability and statistics. And I'm, go I'm going to try to frame the discussion of probability and statistics, of course, in the context of X-ray astronomy, but in particular in the context of uh, X-ray photometry and how we measure light, incoming X-ray light coming from astrophysical sources. So just uh, as a summary from yesterday's lecture, uh, we started talking about X-rays and X-ray astronomy. We went over the history of X-ray astronomy uh, and detection of X-ray X-ray sources uh, during the last 50 years or so. Uh, we also talked about the sources, the astrophysical sources of X-ray radiation and what types of X-ray radiation there could be, thermal versus non-thermal, and the different processes that can lead to X-ray emission. Uh, and I also showed you a little bit how to uh, search for Ch Chandra data and how to download and visualize it. We spoke also about how those Ch Chandra data are basically composed of event files that record the individual energies and then the individual time of arrivals of the individual photons. And a very important lesson, I, I would say, from yesterday's, lesson, uh, from yesterday's lecture is photons. Uh, in X-ray astronomy, we deal with individual photons. And that has a lot of... Uh, implications in terms of how you treat this from the statistical point of view and from the data point of view. And uh, I think that perfectly motivates today's uh, discussion on, on statistics. So today I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a motivation uh, as to why you want to do photometry in X-ray. I mean, of course, you want to know that there are X-ray sources out there, but why are you interested in knowing exactly how much photons are being produced and how far these objects are? Uh, and uh, I'm going to use that motivation to introduce uh, probability and what is the what what intuition tells us about uh, probability. And I'm going to present you with two different philosophical views about what probability actually means: the frequentist view and the Bayesian uh, view. Uh, and then I'm going to try to motivate additional discussion as to why probability is relevant in astronomy. Why is it that we care about probability density functions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in the context of different uh, astrophysical, uh, uh, you know, uh, events, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to introduce uh, some concepts of probability, such as random variables, marginal and conditional probabilities. And towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to tell you how to apply that to the problem of measuring X-ray light uh, by showing you an exercise of a Bayesian uh, a photometry using Chandra data. So let's let's get started. I, I show you yesterday, and I want to try to give you a motivation as to why you want to know what the luminosity of certain objects in X-ray is. And yesterday I mentioned uh, the Eddington puzzle uh, and the most luminous X-ray sources. So I mentioned to you that they are uh, a particular type of X-ray source that is very very interesting because it seems to be very very luminous. And it seems to live preferentially in regions such as the spiral arms of galaxies, which means that 
this super luminous X-ray source is probably not a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, but something related to perhaps a stellar event, something much less massive than a supermassive uh, uh, black hole, but still luminous in X-ray, in, uh, luminous enough to question the physics. And the reason why that happens is because, as I just said yesterday, there is a point in which the radiation pressure from these X-ray photons being produced is so big that it would completely stop the accretion of material into the compact object in the center. It can be a black hole, it can be a neutron star that is accreting materials. And if that happens, then you would expect accretion to stop. And if accretion stops, then you should not be seeing the X-ray uh, photons being produced by this accretion process. So this is a little bit of a puzzle, and it's, it's a very kind of, uh, kind of modern puzzle. People really still don't know what's going on here. I mean, we're not completely blind, but there's there's a couple of there's a couple of possible explanations. Either something happens that makes uh, the radiation of X-ray photons to be non-isotropic and non-uniform. In other in other words, maybe there is some collimation going on, so the amount of photons could still be uh, compatible with the Eddington limit. But if it's if it's uh, kind of collimated into some kind of jet and that jet is pointing towards us. For example, it's collimated because there's strong magnetic fields or because the disk, the accretion disk about this object uh, might be having a geometrical effect that uh, collimates the rays, etc., etc. That could be a possible explanation for it. And if that's the case, you would, you would, you would uh, test that by measuring some sorts of pulsations that generate as the whole system rotates, etc., etc. But that's still not enough for the very, very mass, uh, very uh, most massive and, and luminous objects of this type. So we need additional explanations to try to explain that. Of course, a very exciting possibility is that they could be intermediate mass black holes. So we know that there are stellar, uh, stellar type black holes. So this is basically what results from the collapse of a a uh, normal star, well, a massive star, like eight times or more the mass of the star, it will collapse and it will form uh, an, a, a black hole. And often that black hole will have a companion star from which it accretes material producing X-rays. This is the typical X-ray binary scenario. And we also know that in the center of galaxies, there are supermassive black holes that were probably, you know, the relic of the formation process of these galaxies. And these, uh, uh, these, these have masses, typical masses of millions of solar masses. But we haven't really found anything convincing in terms of the mass of a black hole that is right in between those two extremes. So what's interesting about ultraluminous X-ray sources is that if they are emitting at luminosities that are beyond the Eddington limit for a normal mass star, then we, rather than trying to uh, say that, that something like collimation is happening, what, what we can say is that perhaps what's happening is that this black hole is actually more massive than a typical stellar black hole, some, 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 something in between these two extremes. And that's a very interesting possibility, uh, but it's also diff difficult to prove. We, you, we know that there's different types of objects, and with the emergence of gravitational wave astronomy, we know that... Uh, there are things happening, for example, new, neutron stars sometimes collide, two of them, and form a, a, a black hole. Uh, and black holes can also merge to form even more massive black holes. But the most massive black hole we've detected from gravitational wave astronomy is of the order of 80 solar masses or something like that. We don't really know if there are black holes that are more massive than these. Where, when could these objects have formed? I mean, in this case, they form because two smaller black holes form, but can they also be formed naturally? For example, early on in the universe, when the metallicity of stars was lower, uh, ma stellar masses tend tended to be larger, so stars could, be, could grow bigger, and perhaps there are intermediate mass, mass black holes because they are, uh, they are the result of the collapse of a very, very massive star. Or maybe... Intermediate mass black holes are the results of what happens in a globular cluster, which is basically a collection of stars that, are, that is very dense in the center. And maybe in the center of it, more than one star 
collides with each other and forms something much bigger. So we don't know we don't know what the explanation for this is, but certainly measuring measuring the luminosity of these objects. I mean, if you can know how bright an object like this here is, you will have an initial clue as to whether that is luminous enough to be considered a candidate for being an ultra luminous uh, X-ray source. And if so, whether the physical properties of the light are consistent with it being an intermediate black uh, intermediate mass black hole or some other thing. One other motivation to try to understand the amount of lights that we get from specific astronomical sources are kilonovi. So you have probably heard that uh, there is not, not, not only black holes can collide with each other to, prov to produce gravitational waves, also neutron stars can do that. And we actually know that uh, this has happened and we have detected electromagnetic radiation as well as gravitational waves from events like this. This is, of course, just an artistic impression, but this is basically two neutron stars colliding. These are extremely dense stars. And when they collide, there's a number of things that happen. So one of the things that happens is that all the neutrons that suddenly uh, get ejected from this collision are being... Uh, so the atoms in the vicinity are able to capture these uh, neutrons and that creates... Uh, heavier elements. We today know that the heaviest of all elements in the periodic table are probably produced in a scenario like this. Not even supernova explosions can produce them. But the heaviest elements are pro probably produced because a lot of these neutrons are captured but by already heavy elements uh, in the surroundings of these uh, systems and they get captured and they form even heavier elements. And when these heavy elements that was just formed radiatively decayed, decay, they emit optical and infrared light. And that's what we see uh, as, a, as an afterglow in optical and infrared, and that's what's called a kilonova. That's infrared and optical light that comes from the decay, radioactive decay of these newly formed heavy elements. But another thing that can happen is that there's a shock. Every time there's, there's a collision like this, there's a shock, and that can completely hit the material around this, the, the, the material, the interstellar material around these objects. And that, again, the shock, just like in the supernova Raman, can be responsible for the production of X-rays. However, shocks are not the only possible explanation. Maybe what happens is that the result of this collision is a pulsar, and pulsars can also produce X-ray, or perhaps there is some kind of resonances between the, the crust and the core of the resulting objects, and this produces a, a huge burst of gamma ray bursts that also are also typically accompanied by X-ray emission. So what you see here in the bottom is actual observations from 2017 with the Chandra X-ray telescope of a particular event, uh, GW170817. This is the first gravitational wave event that was associated to the collision of two neutron stars. And we now are able to test these different hypotheses because we're able to collect this X-ray light, measure the amount of light that is here, and uh, also do some uh, time analysis and spectral analysis and determine which of these possibilities regarding the X-ray emission from kilonova remnants is the most uh, pl uh, possible one. So that was a motivation to introduce photometry. So in order to actually do photometry properly when you do uh, X-ray astronomy, you need statistics. And you need statistics not only in this case, but you need statistics for a number of reasons in astrophysics and in general in the physical sciences. So here's, uh, here's a, a few examples of why you actually need statistics to, uh, to do astrophysics. The first, the first reason, of course, is that, that they allow you to describe the properties of data when you collect data from your measurements or when you do classification of sources, et cetera, et cetera, you can describe the properties of those data sets using statistics. You can describe them in the form of distributions or in terms of means and standard deviations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another very important reason why statistics are important is because they allow you to make decision. Uh, you know that one of the central aspects of science is the uh, comparison between a particular hypothesis and data that you take to try to corroborate or reject that hypothesis. And often, as I was just explaining for the case of kilonova emission, there's more than one possible explanation. So you want to be able to compare hypotheses one with the other 
based on the data you have and decide which hypothesis seems more plausible. For example, here you see emission uh, from what appears to be either uh, a, a, an object, this is Chandra data, and you see here on the left, there's, there's a central object with some, with, some, uh, with some luminosity, and then there's kind of this additional thing next to it, and this could be either a different independent source that is basically not resolved because the spatial resolution of Chandra is not enough, or it can actually be a jet. So remember that supermassive black holes or, or any accreting um, object can produce collimated jet, jets of X-ray emission that could be seen as an extension of this X-ray emission. So this could also be a jet. So in order to compare the two hypotheses, is this actually a jet or is this actually two sources? You can do things like, for example, measuring the shape of that, uh, of that profile, light profile. So this is basically if you make a cut through this object and you see how the luminosity changes with distance, you can then compare with models that assume there's a jet there versus model that assumes there's basically just two sources and you actually end up finding by comparing those hypotheses with your data points, you end up finding out that actually the, uh, the hypothesis that this is a jet is more likely than it being to uh, two separate X-ray sources. So model comparison is very important. And in tomorrow's lecture, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, model comparison. Uh, but for today, we want to first plunge into the basics of probabilities and statistics. So let me give you a little bit of an intuition about probability. Probably several of you have taken uh, probability uh, uh, courses before, but I think it's, it's still useful to introduce the very basic. So what is probability? What is your intuitive idea of probability. And of course, uh, the most natural way of thinking about this is by the toes of a coin. So you, we, we, ev we do this every time we need to make a difficult decision and we don't know what else to do. So we toss a coin and we get heads of tails. Uh, and so I could ask you the question right now of how likely is it that you will get heads when you toss a coin in general? If you have a single experiment in which you, you, to you toss a coin, what's, what's the probability that it will fall heads or tails, and you will most likely respond that the probability is uh, uh, a half, 0.5, 50%. And why is that? Why is that you actually say can say that that's the case? It's probably because you've performed experiments many times in your life. You've thrown uh, coins to the air many, many times, and you've realized that about half of the time, the, uh, the, the coin will, will land heads and half of the time it will land coils. So uh, it will land tails. So basically our intuition of probability corresponds to a model of nature that our brain has made. I mean, this is a very simple case, but really the most basic notion of probability is about experience of nature. We do experiments and we know what to expect based on those probabilities. So for example, we speak of the probability that, 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 the, that the coin will... Uh, will land heads, and we call that P, the probability of heads, and that's the fraction of times that the toss res results in, in, in heads. If the, the coin is fair, then you expect that to be about 50%. Uh, that's not always the case, of course. This, this parameter, the probability on, on which uh, the, uh, the, the, the coin will land heads is actually a parameter of your statistical model because you can happen to have a coin that is not absolutely fair, in which case this probability can be slightly different, but you can also quantify that. Same thing goes for dice. You know that there is a certain probability of it landing in two, and then you can always uh, uh, estimate that based on your experience. And our experience in this, in this case says that about one-sixth of the time, if the dice is fair, you'll get a particular number of, uh, the, of the dice. So what if instead you repeat this experiment many times? So suppose you have a coin and you throw it four times. And how do you mathematically express the probability of getting four heads uh, in, the, in, in uh, four successful experiments, getting heads four times, or maybe three heads and one tail? So what is the probability? So in order to do that, you can build a little table like this and see for four independent experiments, what are the possible outcomes? So these are all the possible outcomes, and this is 
uh, the number of heads that you get in each of those different out outcomes. And this is the number of ways in which you get that value. So for example, if you're interested in knowing how, what, how likely is it that you get two heads if you do four experiments, then you count the number of different arrangements it will, in which you will get two heads. And you will realize that six out of total of 16 will be uh, 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 two heads. So that's, that gives you the probability of two heads. Same happens for probability of four heads. In this case, it was called, is there's only one way, one way here in which you can get the four heads. So the probability is one out of 16 uh, possibilities. And for three heads, it will be four of 16, et cetera, et cetera. So to express that mathematically, so you write this, this distribution. And this, the Bernoulli distribution, well, the, the binomial distribution, really, uh, gives you a mathematical expression for the probability of having exactly k successes in a sequence of n identical experiments. And that's given in terms of the factorial of n and k factorial and the factorial of the difference between the two. This will give you uh, the probability distribution for the success uh, of getting exactly k success in a sequence of n identical experiments. So if n is 1, if you do this only once, then you get the Bernoulli distribution, which is basically the probability of a single uh, coin toss. Uh, but basically what this means is that there is this number of ways in which we can distribute k successes or heads in the case of the coin in a sequence of n independent trials. However, in general, the, if the probability is not fair, if your coin is not fair and you have an associated, if you have a biased probability of having one outcome preferentially over the other, you can incorporate that probability here. And now you have that amount that we have just defined multiplied by the uh, product of the two of these uh, probabilities, basically in the case where it's a, a where, where it happens and in the case where it doesn't happen. So you this expression gives you the most general way to describe this uh, binomial uh, probability distribution. And what you have here is basically a visualization of the different uh, uh, probability distributions for different values of the parameter and for the different num number of experiments. So the first thing I want you to notice here is that these distributions are discrete because these are discrete numbers you're dealing with. You're talking about the number of ways that you can distribute the heads and the tails. So that, those are discrete numbers. And you see that that means that these probability distributions are not defined over the entire range of the real numbers, only uh, in integer values of, of that uh, sequence. So you see that, for example, if your probability is exactly half and you do 40 experiments, then these points give you the probability of getting exactly 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 uh, uh, successes, so success, 13 heads, if you perform those, those 40 experiments. And as your intuition dictates, of course, the most likely value is 20. So if, you've, if your coin is fair and you have 50% probability and you do 40 experiments, then you expect that 20 of the times uh, you will get uh, 20. So that just gives you the probability that this will happen. Of course, this shifts uh, away from 20, if you still, uh, if you're, well, if you're doing less experiments, of course, that's it, that shifts, but it also shifts if you change the value of the probability. So, for example, if now you have a slightly lar larger probability of getting, uh, of getting ahead, then your probability shifts towards larger values than, than kind of the mean of the distribution. So you see that behavior there. So this is a very important distribution. Uh, it's, it's also important uh, in our last lecture when we talk about machine learning, you will see the similar distribution can be used to define a classification system uh, based on the logistic regression. So it's a very important one to keep in mind for the future. So when you have events happening, you have a number of rules about the probability of those uh, events happening together. And this, uh, this diagram here seems uh, it's, it's basically uh, designed to depict exactly that, that situation. So basically you have events you have two events, basically heads and tails, or tails, tails and head. And you have, for example, you can try, try to estimate what is the probability of getting the two heads, which would be the intersection of those two. And that you can write as the product EF or E, e in intersect with F. Uh, and uh, you can also have the union of it. So what is the probability that you get at least one head? And that, that will give you the, the union of this. So you can, you can 
you can think of probabilities in terms of set theory as well. Uh, and there is, of course, some basic rules of, the, of, of uh, probability that for some of you might be extremely obvious, but I think it's still worth mentioning. And the first one is that probability always has to be non-negative. Uh, in other words, something must always happen. You have always a probability uh, uh, zero or larger of something. Well, it, it cannot happen, but it cannot happen negatively. So there's always probabilities always larger than zero. It has to be between zero and one. Uh, so basically, either it doesn't happen or something happens, and the sum of the probabilities has always has always uh, always needs to add up to one. Uh, so p of x plus p minus x. So the complement always. This is what I was just saying. Is uh, it has to be it has to be adding to one. So x must either happen or not happen. So if if the event of x happening has a value of 0.3, then the probability of it not happening has to have a probability of 0.7. And uh, when what is the probability of p of x plus y? So what is the probability of either of the two events happening? Well, that is that equals the probability of x happening independently, the probability of y happening independently minus the probability of them happening together. So you need to, to subtract the intersection here in order to not double count uh, in the case of the number of events when that happens. So you can write these rules of probabilities and those are very important. And this is just basically uh, the, the uh, for the case of two coin toses, you have those rules. So the probability of, of uh, getting two tails is equal, uh, assuming that the two experiments are independent, then you can write the product of the two happening as the products of the individual uh, probabilities of each of them happening individually. Uh, whereas in the case, uh, if you want to know what the probability of, of at least one of them happening, then uh, at least, for example, in this case, at least one of the two head experiments being su successful, then you'll have to write it as the sum of them independently minus the amount of times when they happen together. So I was just mentioning about the statistical independence. And basically, we say that random variables, which are basically variables describing the outcomes of this kind of statistical experiments, are independent if the occurrence of one of them does not affect the probability of the other one occurring. So if your two coin toses are independent, uh, if the outcome of the second toast does, is not affected by the outcome of the first one, then those two events are statistically independent. And in, the, and th in this case, you can write the joint distribution of the two events happening as the product of the individual uh, of, of the individual probabilities of each of them happening independently. Uh, and also, uh, another consequence of that is that uh, the uh, the conditional uh, of x happening given y it's equal to, to the probability of X because Y does not affect X. So we will talk about conditionals in a little while, but this is an important consequence of statistical independence. And you can, of course, uh, extend that to more than one variable and write it uh, for more than two events. So in this case, you can write the probability of, of all of them happening together uh, can be written as the probability of one given the other two times the joint probability of the other two and you can also factorize that in this way. So that's uh, an important thing of independence. And what I, what I want you to keep in mind, and this is very important for what comes later in these lectures, is that uh, we often assume statistical independence of, the, of, uh, of measurements, but it's important to know that measurements might not be uh, statistically independent, and therefore you have to be careful when you apply rules of probability in that case. So let's go a little bit back to astrophysics and what is it that we mean that we're measuring something? So suppose you're saying that you're going to measure uh, the, uh, the flux of a star and you are performing experiments to try to determine the flux of that star. And here you have, for example, uh, eight different measurements with, in principle, eight different telescopes of the flux of a given, part uh, a given star. So what you do here uh, is a, an exercise of frequency. You measure your flux with your telescope once, then you measure again, then you measure again, then you measure again, and then you get basically for each of those measurements, each of those measurements will give you a value and then it will have some um, measurement uncertainties associated to it. For example, because the telescope has certain limitations in terms of how well it can measure the light. So you will have an error associated with each, with each of those measurements. And what you're trying to determine 
based on those on the frequency of those measurements and which what frequency you got these different values what's the actual probability of uh what the actual value of the flux that you're trying to measure is so that is exactly how frequentists see probability so the the the, the way in which you think about probability is in terms of a frequency how often does something happen so suppose that you're trying to measure a flux for a frequentist person the flux is a is a well determined given uh, quantity that you're trying to determine it doesn't change and the true flux in this plot is given by this gray line here that uh, uh, that is vertical here and you have many me measurements that you've performed uh, of this flux and each of those measurements has an associated error so when you talk about probability from a frequentist point of view uh, what you what you are worrying about is about calculating the probability of measurements given that there's a true flux and you write it like this. So this is the probability of my data given the true flux. So if you have a data point, uh, what is the probability of getting this data point if my true flux is given by this value? In this case, it's exactly a thousand. So what's the probability of me getting this, this value? And you are assuming that there's some measurement errors. And of course, that's why you don't have exactly the same value for all of them. But but philosophically, what you're thinking about is this value is it's given, it doesn't change, and I'm just going to try to estimate what's the probability of getting this data point and this data point and this data point with, if I have certain uh, measurement errors, if this is the true value. If you want to determine what is the probability of getting all of these experiments, so if you assume they're statistically independent, and as we just saw, you can multiply the probabilities for each of these independent events and get a final likelihood for your data. So this amount that we will call a likelihood is the joint likelihood of my data, given that my model, uh, pro uh, that my parameter has a true value that is given by uh, a thousand units in this case. So we call this the likelihood. This is the likelihood, likelihood of my data given that I am assuming a true unchangeable value of the true, of the flux, of the model. So uh, this basically is the likelihood of obtaining the set of measurements D given the true flux R. So when you when someone tells you that uh, that this likelihood is 85, this likelihood is 85%. What that means is that 85% of the times the error bars will include the actual true value that you are considering. That's basically what this means philosophic, philosophically from the, for the point of view of, uh, of, the, of the frequentist. So what happens if we adopt a different uh, uh, worldview of what probability means? In this case, we're seeing that this is associated with, for frequentists, this is associated with a frequency of something happening. How often does my error bar include my actual value? And we're estimating a likelihood, which is the probability of getting a data set given that I am assuming a true value for my model. A different way of uh, looking into this is Bayesian statistics. And this is uh, extremely important uh, these days for a number of reasons. Uh, but I would say the most important reason is that it gives, you, it gives you a different philosophical framework in which you can think about probability. So instead of thinking about the probability of the data given the model, we are going to ask here, okay, what is the probability of the flux being having a particular value given my data? So maybe you can follow me here that this is a completely different question. We're not asking anymore, okay, I am assuming that the flux is given and unique and it doesn't change. And I'm just going to see what the probability of this data is given that I have that value of the parameter. Here, instead, we're asking, OK, I have some data. I'm going to start from my data. And what is the probability that the, flu that the flux is exactly 1,000 or 980 or 1,002? Uh, what is the probability of that uh, parameter having different values given the data I have? That's a completely different point of view. Basically, the probability is not about frequencies anymore. You're not trying to estimate how many times your measurement will be in certain range. What you're trying to estimate now is how much you believe that your flux has certain value. 
So we're not talking about uh, uh, frequencies anymore. We're talking about the degree of belief. How much do I believe that the true flux of these objects is, is a thousand versus how much do I believe that it's actually a thousand and five or 998? So this is a completely different philosophical way of seeing this. So it, what that implies is that model parameters are not fixed values anymore. They become random variables themselves. So we, we can assign to them a probability distribution function and we're going to describe them in terms of what's the probability of them having a specific value or a range of different values. So the way in which this uh, modifies our understanding of uh, probabilities is that uh, before we were dealing only with the likelihood, right? So we had basically uh, 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 a distribution of uh, the likelihood of a particular quantity uh, and uh, the likelihood is given by the data. But even before we took any data, what's interesting about Bayesian statistics is that you can have a, pre a previous belief of what you think the distribution should be. So even if you, before you take experiments, you know that the object lo you're looking at is a supernova of a given mass. And so you expect the flux to be certain value. So you can encode that belief in something called the prior. And the prior gives you the belief you have on how likely the different values for the parameter are given any previous knowledge that you have on the source. And then you have a likelihood and the likelihood comes from the data. So what happens is that you have a prior, you plug a new, you plug a new probability distribution in, which is the likelihood. This is going to give you the likelihood of your true value that is God given having uh, different values based on your data. And then you update, you update your belief. And now you have a posterior. And, and the way in which you do that is by convolving these two probabilities, the prior and the likelihood to form the posterior. So what's happening here uh, from a philosophical point of view is that you had a previous belief that now you are updating based on new data, in this case, the likelihood. And that gives you a new belief that, you're, that is your posterior distribution. And that posterior is basically any previous belief you had on the quantity. And, and when I say belief, I, I, I don't mean you believe that as a matter of faith, but because you, you know some independent measurements and you know some previous physical information about the system that allows you to estimate what the range of values could be. But you can always update that belief when you plug in uh, the likelihood. And that's what gives you the posterior. And, that, uh, and, and, and it turns out that the posterior, the prior, and the likelihood are all related to each other in what is called the Bayes rule. And the Bayes rule uh, relates uh, the three uh, quantities in this way. So uh, basically what, what the Bayes rule says is that the posterior of the model having certain probability on the parameters based on the data equals the likelihood the probability of the data given the model times the prior, so your prior belief. And this is this PD called often called the evidence is a normalization constant that for the purposes of doing this exercise is not very relevant, but the purposes of model comparison will become very, very important as we will see tomorrow. So basically you can use this quantity here, the, the, the probability of the data given your model, the probability of your data overall how likely is that you get this data at all, the evidence, uh, to compare models. And we will see how to do that. But this is a very important quantity that allows you to estimate your posterior given your likelihood of your data and any previous belief you have on the, on the quantities you're trying to determine. And, and that, uh, here I just break it up. So this is the posterior, the probability of the model parameters given the data. This is what we often want to well, this is what we often want to compute when we're doing Bayesian statistics. Uh, there is the likelihood, which is basically uh, the, uh, basically the expression given by the data, given the models, and this is the frequentist approach. There's the model prior, and there's the evidence of data probability, and that will help us in model comparison. So uh, basically, uh, I one thing that I want you to be aware of is that often in astronomy and in other and in, in in any statistical ex uh, exercise where you're dealing with a posterior, these posteriors can be defined in many, many dimensions and they can they, they might not have uh, an, an analytical expression to be estimated and they can be extremely hard to, to compute 
So if you want to really summarize all the probabilistic information you have about a particular quantity and you have a posterior that describes it, that posterior might not be easily uh, computed. And that's why you need techniques like MCMC sampling, et cetera, et cetera, that we'll be dealing with uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, I just wanted to point out at this point that the Bayes theorem does not come from uh, any from, from magic. It, it's not just uh, a rule of, of nature. It basically comes from the from the rules, the product rules of uh, rules of probability. So you can express a probability of a of a given b uh, uh, as uh, basically the the ratio of the joint probability and the probability of b. And similarly, you can calculate the, the probability, probability of B given A as the joint divided by probability of A. And if you just uh, if you just do algebra with these two entities, you will eventually arrive to the uh, base uh, theorem. And this is this is not what I mean. It's not the theorem itself that gives sense to probability to Bayesian probability. Bayesian probability is not really about the base theorem that just comes from a normal rule of probabilities that can be also used in a frequentist context. What Bayesian statistics is about really is about the interpretation that we give to probability. Probability is not about the frequency of how often I will get a data point. It's about how much do I believe that my parameter has a particular value. So what you're doing here is you're inferring the physics. You're trying to infer how likely is that your model parameter has a given value. For example, the mass of, of a black hole. How much do I believe, given everything I have, my model and, and my data, how much do I believe that the mass of the black hole is 10 solar masses versus 10.5? That's what Bayes rules, Bayesian uh, uh, statistics uh, give us, a different way to interpret uh, reality. So as you see, there is a number of interesting things that get described by a probability distribution. So we were just talking about the likelihood. We're talking about the posterior. These are all distributions of probability. And in fact, there is a number of interesting uh, um, uh, quantities that are described in astrophysics that are given by probability distribution. So one uh, that I can think of that is uh, quite interesting is the initial, initial mass function. This is also this is also a probability distribution, and this relates to the distribution of mass, which we with which stars are formed. So when when stars form together, they don't all form with the same mass, and you need to uh, account for that distribution of different masses uh, for a, for a given total uh, mass of stars, and that's usually given by a probability distribution uh, that we that we call the initial mass function. You that that will basically give you. The, uh, the amount of stars that will form that are larger than one solar mass and the amount of stars that will form that will be larger than 10 solar masses, et cetera, et cetera. And the specific shape of that function, of that probability distribution function, specifically at the low end of the masses is extremely important because it will tell us about what is the real total content of stellar mass in a particular system because most of the stars will have low masses. And it's extremely important to characterize that probability distribution function in the low mass end. And that's something that people are still working on and that hopefully will improve a lot over the next years, next years with the launch of JWST, et cetera, et cetera. But there are other distributions. There are other probability distribution functions in astronomy apart from the initial mass function. Uh, we can think, as we will see in this lecture, about the distribution of X-ray photons hitting a detector and forming a particular image that is given by a Poisson distribution, and which we will see later. And this is the expression by a, for a Poisson distribution uh, of X-ray photons or whatever Poisson process is process, uh, happening. Notice that, as I mentioned before, this is a distribution that is discrete rather than continuous. There's also a distribution that can describe a measurement error. So for example, when you're trying to describe your data points uh, in terms of the brightness as a, as a function of, uh, of wavelength. In other words, you're trying to measure the spectrum of an object. Uh, you can often, people often assume, and you can do that, uh, uh, that the errors are distributed uh, as a Gaussian. And that's a, that's a strong assumption. And we will discuss whether that's actually appropriate to do or not. But that's, uh, that's something that people often do. They assume that measurement errors, in other words, the shape of these errors represented by the error bars are actual Gaussian distributions that are described by this, uh, by this equation. So that's another distribution that is used 
in the context of astrophysical and physical measurements. And then there's distributions that allow us to, uh, to, to, to reject hypotheses. So for example, some of you will be familiar with the chi-square distribution, and I will describe that in more detail later. But the chi-square distribution that is basically a comparison be between a model prediction and your actual data points taken uh, gives you a single number that will tell you how good or bad your fit is. And that number, if you repeat that experiment many, many times, will not always come back as the same number. It will have a distribution. And the chi-square distribution looks like this, and it gives you a, a way to reject an hypothesis. So for example, uh, if this is the distribution of the, of the uh, chi-square value, assuming a particular hypothesis, and you turn out to get a chi-square number that is very far away in the wing, then you can deduce that the probability of your hypo that the that your hypothesis is probably not correct because you would expect the chi square value to be closer to the peak of the distribution. So that's a number of different probability distribution functions that are used in astronomy, and in particular, I will be focusing uh, today uh, about Poisson statistics because those are the ones that you want to deal with when you want to measure X-ray photons. So there's a number of properties that you can use uh, properties and, and, and facts about uh, probability distribution functions. Basically, the most important thing really is actually the, the last one that I wrote here. A probability distribution function gives you the full information about the uncertainty you have on a, on a quantity. So if you have a random variable, which can be the parameter of a model, the PDF of that, the posterior PDF, in the case you're doing this in a Bayesian way, of that, uh, of that quantity, the posterior probability distribution function will give you all the amount you need in terms of how certain and uncertain this, uh, this measurement is or this inference is. So you will know exactly how likely it is that that parameter has these different values. But you can use them to sample. They have predicting power. So once you've determined the shape of a particular distribution function, you can always sample from it. So you can take samples from it uh, and there's, there's, there's several techniques in which you can, that you can use to sample distributions, but you can, you can use a distribution to draw samples and do, do predictions. So if you know that the masses of black holes in the universe distribute according to this red line, you can always statistically, statistically simulate uh, new black holes being formed by drawing from this distribution of mass and uh, creating black holes that follow the same distribution. So uh, let's move on to uh, the problem of photometry. And of course, this is, this is what you do when you are looking at an X-ray source with a telescope like Chandra, and you're trying to determine what the photometry is. So what is the quantity that you actually want to infer in this case when you're trying to do this exercise? All you get, of course, is photons, individual photons that hit the detector. But you, what you want to actually estimate is a rate is the flux or, or the amount of photons that actually leave your source per unit time. Uh, uh, and, and that's the, the actual quantity. That's your parameter, your model parameter that you want to determine. And because these are discrete events, the, the arrival of individual photons in your detector is a discrete event, then they are best uh, described by the Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution is written here. So this is the probability of uh, counting a given number of observed number of counts, given that I have a particular rate of emission of those objects. So if my object emits X-rays at a particular given rate, what is the probability of getting this number of counts, three counts or four counts or six, six counts, et cetera, et cetera. It, the Poisson distribution is written like this. So again, this is your model parameter. This is the actual rate that you're trying to determine. And uh, this is uh, M is the parameter and D is the different values that uh, the, the distribution can adopt. Uh, and so basically what this means is this the probability of finding D events uh, in, a, in a data set, in a, in a given data set, uh, uh, given that the object is emitting at a constant rate of M. And this is basically uh, the typical expression for the Poisson distribution. And you see here the distribution of the Poisson function for different values of M. Again, uh, this is just telling you what the probability of getting one or two or three or five counts is given that you have these different actual rates. So you want 
to uh, infer what M is, you're trying to infer the actual model parameter, you're trying to infer what the actual rate of emission of these objects is based on the distribution of your data. And then these distributions, this uh, Poisson distribution will give you the, the probability of getting different counts given those, uh, those model values for the actual rate. What's interesting is that uh, when you have, uh, when, when your number, when your count becomes very high, if you're counting not X-rays, but optical photons that are much more numerous and are emitted in much larger quantities, then the Poisson distribution will converge to a Gaussian distribution. As you can basically infer by, by the shape of these distributions, it will eventually convert, convert itself into a Gaussian distribution. Uh, and that's basically in the limit when your rates and your events are not discrete anymore, when you have a whole bunch of events happening very rapidly at, at a very, very high rates, then this will turn into the Gaussian distribution that is a continuous distribution. So uh, uh, let's, uh, let me see how much time I have left. So I'm gonna uh, move on to try to give you the, uh, uh, the, the taste as how, how we use these Poisson distributions and how we use statistics to actually perform photometry in astrophysics. So one, uh, one important thing that I want you to keep in mind here is what the expected values are. Uh, basically, expected values are associated to random var variables, right? A random variable can be basically that model parameter that you're, you're going to try to determine and that to which you uh, assign a particular uh, probability distribution function. And you're going to try to uh, uh, determine what the expected values, value of that particular a random variable is. So what is the expectation value for a particular random variable? So the random variable can be, for example, the outcomes of your, uh, of your toes, uh, of your coin toes, or the outcomes of your measurement of flux. And what is the expected value? Well, intuitively, what the expected value gives you is the long run average of repetitions of the experiment. So if you're trying to estimate, uh, for example, a particular, uh, for example, with the dice, if you throw the dice many times, then you will have a different outcome every time you throw a die. Sometimes it will come up as a one, sometimes it will come up as a three, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens if you measure the average of that quantity as you get more and more uh, experiments? You will see that eventually that average will converge to a value which corresponds to the mean of the value of the different possible outcomes of the experiment, in this case, 3.5. So intuitively, this is the long run average of the, your repeated experiment. That is the expected value. What it actually means, it, what it actually means uh, in, in practice and also formally is that it is, it is the probability weighted average of all possible values. So if you have all possible values of, the, of, your, of your outcome and each of those values has a given probability, then you can estimate the expected value of your quantity as a weighted average in which each possible outcome is weighted by its probability. In this case, if the dice is fair, you have one sixth of probability for each of the different outcomes. And if you do a weighted average of all of those, you will get your expected value. And the expected value is an important quantity because it's what you typically report when you uh, are dealing with uh, a probability distribution function. What is the expected value that you get from this distribution? What is the most likely value that you'll draw from this distribution when you make a particular measurement? Uh, I, I was talking earlier also about uh, conditional and marginal probabilities. This is, uh, this is extremely important as well in the particular case of uh, astrophysical modeling uh, and in the case even of measuring fluxes when, you have, when you're trying to measure the flux uh, from, from different sources, et cetera, et cetera. And that is when you have two different events, uh, you can estimate the joint probability of the two events happening together. And if you look at this plot here in the bottom right, you see that basically uh, we have uh, a distribution of probability in a multidimensional space. So you have, a, you have one event on one axis and the other event in the other axis. And this represents the joint probability of the two events happening. So you see that this has a particular shape. In this case, it's a particular Gaussian shape. But you can also think in terms of, apart from thinking about in terms of, of the joint distrib distribution, that is the, the probability of them happening together for different values of those parameters, then you can also think of the, of the probability of A happening 
uh, when all possible values of B are considered. That's what's called the marginal distribution. So what is the probability of this event happening, Y in this case, regardless of what the value of X is? So in this case, what you do is you integrate over all possible values of X and you get, it's like if you would squeeze this distribution all the way along the x-axis, and then you get a resulting Gaussian distribution here. And that Gaussian distribution is the marginal distribution, uh, uh, the, the, the marginal distribution uh, of uh, the marginal distribution when you integrate, when you marginalize over one of the two parameters to estimate the marginal distribution of the other parameter. And then you can also talk about the probability of A given a specific value of B. So how, how is my, if, 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 if my X has a particular value, what is the conditional distribution of Y conditioned on X being exactly X zero? So that's basically what you get if you make a cut here and you will get a conditional distribution of Y's for a given specific value of, of, uh, of, uh, of X. So those are very important quantities as you will see also when you estimate fluxes and other quantities in X-ray uh, astronomy, basically sometimes you want to be marginalizing because you don't care. You're only, you on, if you only care about the probability of one event and you don't care about what the other events are, then you, mar you marginalize and get the marginal distribution. If you, on the other hand, want to know what the probability of an, object, of, of, uh, an event happening, what the, when the other event adopts a particular value, then you want to do a conditional distribution. And the joint, the marginal, and the joint distributions are three different you know, views of, uh, of the probability of events happening simultaneously. So let's go back to X-ray astronomy and how, how we measure photometry in X-rays. So uh, basically, this is, as I was mentioning earlier on, extremely important for the determination of the fluxes. And the determination of the fluxes will be in place important for uh, comparing our hypothesis with particular measurements. And it turns out that in X-rays, uh, photometry can be a complicated business. The reason is that as you see here, and on the left, these are two, these are two images from, from uh, the Chandra archive. The one on the left is an image of the Orion Nebula region. So this is a very rich star forming region, uh, M42, the famous Orion Nebula. And you see the lots of the stars, lots of these young stars that are accreting uh, in, the process, in the process of uh, forming uh, the star in the center and the planetary systems uh, uh, emit significant amounts of X-rays. And you see this almost, it almost looks like an optical image because you have so many photons coming from these objects that you see them very clearly. But if you look at objects that are more distant, for example, galaxies in a galaxy cluster, you can infer there is, uh, that there is X-ray flux here and there is X-ray flux here, but here you start to see that those uh, photons are arriving one by one. So here you're in the Gaussian re regime. Here you tend to be in the Poisson regime where you only detect a few photons and you want to infer what the actual flux of these quantities is. So this is a complicated uh, problem. Or it, it's statistically interesting, more than complicated, because now you have only some data points that are the individual photons that you detect here and you want to infer the actual flux of that. And how is it that you do this? Well, this is how it can be done. So you can estimate this using Bayesian statistics so that you can produce a posterior distribution for each of the fluxes, given your, your uh, amount of counts that you have in each aperture. So what you, hear, what you have here is a Chandra image. This is an event file that has been binned to produce this image. And you see that there's a number of sources. And you see that in some cases, those sources tend to overlap with, it, with each other. So in this case, you have one, two, three, four sources uh, that are clumping together. And you want to determine the flux for each of those sources. And uh, what you have here is the four distributions corresponding to the fluxes of those sources. In this case, the actual number of counts. But what's interesting is that you have a single data set that basically has these events that have been uh, recorded here, you know that there are more than one source there. And you know that also that there's a background region and you're trying to determine what is the most likely flux for each of these objects. So in order to do that, you can define a model. Uh, and the model you define is basically a Bayesian model of probabilities. So 
we want to determine the marginalized posterior probability density functions for the photon flux for several sources simultaneously. So we want to determine these, uh, these fluxes independently. So we don't want to estimate the joint probability of all the fluxes together. We want to determine them individually. And that's where we would talk about the marginalized. So I want to determine the flux of this source uh, when I marginalize over all other possible fluxes of the other sources, because I'm only interested in this source. So that's why we say marginalized. And all I have in place before I start my experiment is uh, the observables, which are basically the amount of counts that I have in each of these regions. So each of these regions defines uh, one particular source, and I have a number of counts that fall in this aperture, a number of, co of uh, a number of counts that fall in this aperture, a number of counts that fall in this one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this would be my counts in each of the individual apertures, and I also have the number of counts that fell in the background. So I'm going to try to infer what the most likely uh, what the most likely uh, flux for the background is. Uh, or flux density for the background is, and what the most likely flux is for each of the sources, starting from the individual const counts that I have in each of the apertures and, and in the background aperture. So the way in which I can do this uh, is uh, basically uh, by defining this little model here. And this is a very simple model. This is, uh, as you can see here, this is going to be a posterior. This is going to be a posterior. I am going to try to do, give the probability of the actual of the actual fluxes that I am calling here S1, S2, Sn, and the background flux given the observed the observed counts. It counts in the first aperture, count in the second aperture, et cetera, et cetera, and the number of counts in the background. And what this is, is basically a uh, product of a posterior for uh, the background this is given by the prior of the background. What is my prior belief on what the number, what the flux should be for the background times a Poisson distribution. And what is the Poisson distribution? The Poisson distribution is basically how do I expect the counts to distribute for a given expected number of counts, given the observations, the, the number of counts that I observe in my background times the independent measurement for each of the apertures. So for each of these, circles here for each of these ellipses here that, that, that are my aperture areas, I am going to describe this as a Poisson distribution as again. The, and, the, and the parameter of the Poisson distribution here will be the expected number of counts. And that will depend. Uh, and this is basically the, the number of counts that I am observing. And this is the prior. So again, this is a very simple statistical model that I'm is assuming that the distribution of counts in each of those apertures and in the background is given by a Poisson process. And all you have is what you've measured, the B and the Cs, and you're going to try to determine uh, what the S are. And uh, though that, that relates with the expected number of counts that you, that you expect in your, in your aperture. And those quantities, the expected number of counts uh, in the aperture and in the background is given by this by this uh, by this parameter here, which are the expected total number of counts in the source and the background, uh, respectively. So, in case you're wondering what this is, this is just basically uh, the the this is the expected number of counts will be the actual flux. Uh, this here is just a fraction of how much of the PSF falls in that particular aperture, uh, and this is basically the area of the background uh, the background area. So that's for the uh, for the counts in the individual aperture uh, ellipses. And in the case of the background, this will be, uh, on, uh, by the way, we also uh, multiply by an, by an exposure. Because remember, I told you yesterday when, that when Chandra takes the observations, it doesn't stay in one single place. It moves across the sky. And you need to compute the actual exposure of each location in the sky, in the, in the sky based on that motion and based on the sensitivity of the instrument. So this is just basically telling you what you expect the counts to be if your, if your actual flux is S for each of the apertures, and this is giving you what your measurement, what the expected value of the measure, measurement is for the background flux, uh, if, if all you have is uh, the, the counts that you've determined on the back. So these are the parameters of the model. And then you plug this in, 
uh, and that's how you will calculate uh, using this model your posterior. So this is your final posterior, and then you can try to estimate this using uh, Bayesian uh, statistics, trying to determine what the shape of that this posterior is. But remember, I told you. Remember, this is a joint posterior for all of the sources. So you are marginalizing to get all of these, but your posterior is actually the joint posterior for all of them. If you see here, you have the joint posterior for all of the quantities that you're going to determine all of them together. Uh, and this posterior, again, as I mentioned before, might not be very easy to estimate uh, analytically. And that's why in these cases, you want to use methods of Monte Carlo sampling in order to get uh, the, the value of that. So, uh, so that's basically the model that you use to estimate a, a photometry. You can do the same for the harness ratios. Do you remember what the harness ratios are? The harness ratios are basically the ratios uh, of how, may, how much of your photons in your X-ray measurements are hard versus how many of them are soft. Uh, and those harness ratios are important for a number of reasons. And it turns out that you can define those harness ratios using the fluxes in the different bands. So when you, use, when you estimate a harness ratio, you need at least two bands. Uh, basically, you're going to compare how many photons are hard versus how many photons are soft. So you have, a, you have a hard and a soft band and you can define the harness ratios based at the, the, we're going to define the harness ratios in terms of the fluxes in each of those two bands, X, band X and band Y, that can be the soft and hard band. And you're going to define the harness ratios based on those two quantities by using this, uh, these two expressions. So the, the harness ratio, is basically the quantity that satisfies these two equalities here. And that allows you to write a uh, probability for the posterior, a probability for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the joint probability of the two fluxes. And this is a differential element on each of the two fluxes. Uh, and if you, if, you do, if you do the derivative, then you, you can write this expression where you've assumed then the two fluxes are given independently. And so you can write the joint distribution the, as the product of the two. Uh, and you have derived uh, uh, these quantities in order to come up with these expressions. If you integrate this quantity over all possible values of the sum of the fluxes, you don't care how much the sum of the fluxes is. So you marginalize over it. So if you, if you integrate, then you get a probability distribution function for the harness ratios themselves. And the harness ratios will give you uh, and, and this probability distribution will be the probability distribution for the harness ratios. So the expected value for this distribution will be whatever value of x of h x y the harness ratio in these two bands that maximizes this integral, and that's what you're after. Why is it the harness ratios are important? Well, as I said, if uh, the harness ratios are just basically a measurement of the shape of the spectrum. So you have a spectrum that ha has a, an X-ray spectrum that has a particular shape, and uh, uh, and that shape can be uh, can be the result of the X-ray source having extremely hard photons and a lot of hard photons and a very few amount of uh, soft photons, or the other way around. You can have a lot of soft X-ray photons and a small amount of X of hard X-ray photons, and the ratio between these will give you the ha the, the harness ratio. And it turns out that depending on how the different harness ratios distribute in different bands, you can use that to classify sources. So for example, supernova remnants, uh, ultra-luminous X-ray sources, stars, galaxies, they, they will all distribute differently in, the, in that diagram of, of X-ray harness uh, ratios. So that means that determining the harness ratios is extremely important for classifying X-ray sources, but not only for that, they also, they also help in trying to determine the evolution of, part of particular objects. So if you are looking at X-ray binaries, for example, during the process of accretion, as a new kind of event of accretion uh, happens, these objects will move in this diagram of luminosity versus spectral harness because uh, there will be moments in will they will be dominated by thermal emission and there will be moments when they will be dominated by non-thermal emission. And what that means is that there is, as these objects evolve, they move in this luminosity harness ratio diagram. And so when you measure the harness ratio of an X-ray source, for example, if you have a collection of candidates of being X-ray binaries, then you can use the information to try to determine where along, the where along this evolution of the system, the accreting system is. So this is the reason why you want to do this 
in a statistically formal way because you don't want to be making uh, the incorrect inference, inferences. And this is exactly what we've done with these particular models. So I hope in this first hour, I have given you a, a good sense as to why uh, the luminosity, uh, the, the uh, statistics are so important in the determination of luminosity and of uh, measurements of photometry. Uh, the last one last thing I wanted to mention is about how do you actually estimate uh, 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 the, the, whether your model and your data agree, and this is, this is typically called a statistic. Uh, you've seen that I've mentioned before the chi-square statistic, that is basically what compares your model to your, to your data in the, particular of a, in the particular case of a Gaussian error measurement. Well, for the, for the case of the Poisson distribution, we also have a statistic, and that statistic is very easily de derived from, from, the, from, the likelihood, from the Poisson likelihood itself. So here we have the likelihood for a Poisson process. So you basically have, again, your model parameter, which is the, the flux or the rate of arrivals that you're trying to infer. These are the different values. Uh, the DIs are the different values over which you want to actually estimate uh, the probability. And this is the expression for the Poisson distribution. So if you want to maximize the likelihood, so what is the value of M that maximizes my value? What is the expected value of M given my data D? Uh, you, can, you want to maximize this, but maximizing this is the same as minimizing its, the negative of its logarithm. So you can estimate, you can take the logarithm of this expression, then take the, 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 the negative value, and then you can uh, define this quantity C that is basically minus two times the logarithm of this expression here. And this quantity will tell you uh, how close your model is from your data. So for a, for a particular value of M that agrees very well with the data, this uh, quantity uh, will be low. And for a, of, of a value of M that disagrees strong, strongly with the data, this quantity will be high. So we want to try to minimize this quantity, minimize the statistic to you do your fit. So this statistic is called the cash statistic and is very... Uh, very widely used when you're trying to determine the uh, goodness of the fit in the Poisson region. So what I'm going to show you in the practical session after the break is uh, an exercise uh, as to how to do this with code. So I am going to introduce you to some code that you can use to try to infer the photometry of particular X-ray measurements by using a Bayesian analysis with code. So I'm going to basically implement this little model here that I described for the Bayesian photometry. I'm going to implement it in code. It's, uh, it's actually a very simple exercise and I'm going to show you how to do that. And after we do that, I will try to uh, round up yesterday's uh, notebook on the Chandrasos catalog and I will show you how to actually extract quantities and data products uh, from the Chandrasos catalog. And I think at this point, it's uh, good to uh, make take a 10-minute break. And if you have any questions for this first part, let me know. OK, thank you, Juan Rafael. It was, yeah, this is statistics. You have to take it slow. You have to digest all this information. It's very important. And uh, yeah, this is what you were showing us in the, in the notebooks. So before the questions, you have two questions in the chat. But uh, I think it's better if we make a small break Let's clear a little bit our, our heads, digest the information, and we will be back in 10 minutes. Uh, and you can answer the, the questions, and we can move on to the notebooks if it's OK for you. OK, let's do it like that okay. after break then. OK, so we will turn off our cameras and microphones for 10 minutes, and we will be back with Juan Rafael in the practical session.
Okay, we are back after this 10 minute break and uh, we will restart uh, with the questions that we have right now from uh, the comments of the public. So I will go with the first one, Juan. Uh, Joshua is asking you, could the posterior distribution be full by the priors? Thanks, Joshua. That's, uh, that's actually a an, an very interesting and relevant question. Uh, as I as I said before, uh, the, the the you know the decision as to whether you should interpret your results in a frequentist or 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 Bayesian way is more of a philosophical question. I think the real question is to what extent you believe you have enough data to uh, to trust your likelihood uh, over your your over your prior belief, uh, your prior. Uh, you, if you have if you have very few data points, you can always be dominated by the prior. If you have a very strong prior uh, and you don't have enough data to update uh, that uh, that amount of information, then you will still be dominated by your prior. And of course, that has the risk that if your prior is wrong for whatever reason, then you, you run into problem. So yes, the answer to your question is yes. You have to carefully think about how much information you actually have in your data, uh, how, how different your prior looks from uh, your likelihood, uh, because if they're extremely different, of course, you might, be, uh, you might be rather concluding that either your former belief is not very correct, or maybe there's something wrong with the data you have. But uh, you, have to be, uh, you have to be careful about the interpretation of the, of the results in that case. Uh, you want to have solid data before, uh, if you if you very very much trust your prior, you have to have very very you want to have very solid data before you update uh, your prior with uh, with those data. Okay. Following up, hey Joshua, about the information that we can get from a photon, does all of it comes from its wavelength, or uh, are there other properties that we can take from? In the context of the actual uh, astrophysical info, uh, observation, of course, uh, the energy is part of it. Uh, and, and then that's the only part of it intrinsic to the photon that is, in principle, of relevance. Uh, but at least from the, from the observations that can be taken with Chandra, you can think also in terms of polarization. And in that information, the electromagnetic wave of the X-ray uh, data could also have extra information about polarization. We don't do polarimetry with Chandra, but that can be done. Uh, but in, term, in the more general context of the observation, of course, you also want to know uh, not only what the energy of that photon is, but what the distribution of the other, uh, the distribution of energies for all the uh, photons recorded is. You want to know where in the detector you captured it, and you want to know when in time you captured it. But intrinsically, yes, the energy uh, that is uh, given by the wavelength is, is all we need to know uh, if we're not dealing with uh, polarimetry. Okay, thank you, Juan. Okay, so we had those two questions only on the chat, so uh, let's move on with the practical session. Uh, you're okay. sharing your screen, but... Uh, uh, do you see okay. the presentation now? It's not in presentation mode no, yet. Okay, it's fine. I just, I just, I just want to say, yeah, I know that was the, the previous hour was a lot of information about statistics. If there is one single message I want you to take home, is the fact that quantities that you measure in astronomy uh, have associated uncertainties uh, uh, to them, and measuring those uncertainties is extremely important in particular when you do when you use those quantities to infer physics. And when you infer physics, for example, you want to infer the flux of an X-ray source, uh, you, uh, and you use measurements that have uncertainties, you can use the Bayesian interpretation to consider your quantities that you're trying to measure as random variables themselves. So you associate probabilities to them. So you're not saying a final truth this quantity has this value, but you're saying this quantity has a distribution of probability that is given by two things. My prior belief on what that quantity should be updated by the data I'm taking now that comes in the form of, of likelihood. So all, all uh, if, if there's a message I want you to take home from this long discussion of statistics and probability, that would be it. And all, I'm going, all I want to show you now is a very simple exercise, exercise and implementation uh, of this uh, photometry exercise 
using a particular uh, package, uh, which is called PyMC3. Uh, uh, PyMC3 is a MCMC uh, package in Python that allows you to sample complex posterior distributions. And these posterior distributions we're going to be dealing with here are not necessarily very complex, but it's, it, it, they provide a good reference for an example as to how you would do that. So the model we're going to try to implement here is the model you see here is the model for a situation in which you have counts and you have aperture counts and you can count the number of events that happen inside each of these apertures. And based on those events that are the B and the Cs, which are just counts in those individual apertures, you're going to try to infer the joint distribution of uh, the fluxes that are being emitted for each of those sources. And those, uh, the, the way in which the counts are related to the fluxes are controlled by these quantities here, which are the expected number of counts given the exposure, given the fraction of the PSF that falls in each of the apertures, and given the area of the apertures. All, what, all the rest you have there is quantities that either you have measured or, or you want to determine. So in order to do that, I am going to use, uh, I have shared uh, earlier today, and I believe you have that, uh, a, a, uh, a note, IPython notebook where I will be implementing uh, this little exercise based on Chandra data. So this is actual ch real Chandra data. It's a, it's a situation very similar to the one I was showing you in this slide where you have basically a number of sources that are close together and you're going to try to measure how much flux is coming from each of them. And in order to do that, I'm going to use PyMC3. For those of you who are working in the university machines, you should, you should have it installed there and you should be able to follow this uh, and code it up and actually run it in your Jupyter session. If not, or if you haven't installed it yet, it's not a big deal. Uh, I will uh, just uh, uh, go over the notebook myself and I will show you what, what happens in each step. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about PyMC3, then you can go to, to the page, uh, where, where, uh, which is also provided as a link in the notebook, where you will learn about how this works. But just in, in a simple uh, word, what PyMC3 does is it samples posteriors using MCMC. MC Monte Carlo methods is basically a way, uh, a, an algorithm to try to obtain samples from your distribution. If you have any distribution, then you can obtain samples from it. And we will talk a bit more in, a lot more in detail about that tomorrow. But all I'm going to say now is you can sample from these distributions to try to determine what the actual shape of the posterior is. And PyMC3 provides you that with a way to provide to, to perform those samples. Okay. So this is this is why and, and the other important thing about PyMC3 is that it uses uh, state of the art Hamiltonian Monte Carlo techniques which are very efficient at sampling a probability distribution function. If there's anything that's made the boom of Bayesian statistics and machine learning uh, possible in the last uh, 10, 15 years, it's been the development of methods that are very efficient at sampling distributions and sampling distributions often by taking the derivative of those distributions with respect to the parameters. And that was extremely difficult to do from a computational point of view before but now with new uh, computational tools, it's very easy to do. So that's, that's what PyMC3 is doing. You give it a posterior, it will try to get samples from that posterior and it will visualize, visualize those samples to give you the approximate shape of your posterior probability distribution, okay? So uh, basically uh, in, the, in, the, in the GitHub page that I have provided with you, you will have this notebook and then you will also have a bunch of files that look like this. These are specific, Chandra-specific photometry files that, uh, that allow you to, uh, pr to generate the photometry. If you, uh, use, if you look into what's in those files, you will notice that each of those files, so here, by the way, I'm using AstroPy for, the, for, the, uh, for dealing with the, um, with the uh, uh, FITS files. I'm using NumPy uh, and, of course, PyMC3 and I'm plotting using uh, matplotlib. What these files contain, basically they will be identified in each case by an OPS ID. So this is basically a region that has been observed several times. 
So you have not one event file, by se but several event files of the same region. So this is, again, an observation of the same region done in separate times. So you will basically have an image for each of those times. So each of those files, I think there's 10 of them in the folder. It's one independent observation of that, one independent experiment, if you want to, uh, of, the of the measurement of the fluxes uh, on, those, uh, particular, on that particular region. And this, uh, this number is just what identifies the group of objects. So if you look in that file, what, you, what you'll see it has, it, it, it's got a number of matrices. And those matrices are basically the, uh, the, the, these numbers, these numbers, right, that, that I have presented to you before, uh, for each of the different sources, for each of the different apertures. So if you're going to do this proper, properly, uh, you need to realize that the, for each of these apertures, there will be, you see that they overlap sometimes, they are close to each other. That means that in this aperture, there are probably counts from this source, but there are also counts from this source that is very close by. And some of the photons that you're detecting in this aperture actually come from this other aperture. So if you want to do this, you want to measure what is the fraction of photons that come from the other sources into each of the, the apertures you are considering. And that's why this is giving us a matrix, FIIJ. Basically, that means the fraction of the PSF uh, for source I in aperture J, right? Uh, and that's why you have this as a matrix. So these quantities here, these files, they contain those matrices for each of these uh, apertures and for, and for each of these sources. And they basically have the uh, exposure. They already have the information you need. So you, you don't need to make this calculation here. They are just given in these FITS files. The, the numbers that you see in these matrices that you can see, for example, here correspond to the different sources. So you see there is one, two, three, four, five sources here. Uh, and uh, for each of those five sources, you have the apertures and you have the contributions from each of the other sources. So you have a matrix of five by five, and this is what uh, this what this uh, prep three files contain. So we're going to take those files that contain these quantities for all possible combinations of all the apertures and all the sources, and we're going to build a probabilistic model, and we're going to try to determine a posterior probability distribution for the fluxes or of each of them. By the way, when you multiply it by the exposure time, you convert the number of counts into a flux. And that's why it's important to quantity. If you were only interested in estimating the actual number of expected counts, then you, wouldn't need, you, would, need to, you would not need to do this multiplication, but we're going to do it because we want to know the, the, the answer in terms, of, uh, in terms of a flux unit, Rx per second. So uh, basically, the, the, the only thing you do here is uh, for each of those PREP3 files, we're going to do two things here. We're going to assume that the sources, first, we're going to assume that the sources are not variable. What that means? That means is, what that means is that if you have observed the, 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 the same region of the sky five times, you expect the fluxes of those sources to remain constant. So you can assume that for all of the observations, you can fit the model with the same parameter. You will have one single flux for each of the sources. So this source will have a flux, this source will have another flux, this source will have another flux. And when you look at, and, and when you switch to another observation of the same region, you will still assume that the fluxes are the same. They, are, they have not changed. So what that allows you to do is that allows you to, uh, that allows you to model this with a single model parameter for each of the sources. Uh, whereas if it's changing, then you can do a model where in each observation, the flux is different. And we are also going to do that. So we're going, we're, we're going to first assume that the flux is the same, which means that we're going to, which we're going to use the same model parameter for, for the flux across all observations, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm going over all the PREP3 files, all of the 10 observations that were done of this particular region. And I am going to take those matrices that contain these quantities here, right? This is what uh, these uh, uh, files contain, the PREP3 files. 
And I'm going to take those quantities. Uh, by the way, basically, the reason why there are more than one matrix here is because this one is for flux. This one is for photon flux. So basically, how many photons per unit time you get instead of how many energy. This one is only for the counts. So basically, depending on the units you want your answer on, you can pick a particular one. Because I want this to be in, in units of energy, then I'm using, yeah, I'm, I'm picking this one, which is the one that contains the exposures in terms of energy units, right? So I'm going to take for each of them, and I am going to just stack them together. So basically, I am going to create, uh, basically, I'm just going over each single file, right? I am going to take those matrices for each of those files, and I am going to stack them together. As you see here, basically, all I'm doing is I am uh, appending the matrix values uh, for each of the 10 observations to the previous one. So at the end, as you see here, what I, what I, will, what I will have is a matrix of 5 by 5, 10 times. So I'm just stacking together a single array that will give me my uh, expected values of the outcome of my thetas and my, of my phis, which again are just the expected num the expected fluxes. You can think of this as the expected flux. This is going the parameter of your Poisson distribution, right? Because this will be the expected rate that you get. So this will be the parameter of your, of your Poisson distribution. And all I'm doing here is I'm stacking them together because I am going to consider that for all of them, uh, I am going to use the same model. So I, I, I stack them together as a single array. And that's what this uh, theta uh, quantity contains. If you, uh, if you look at theta, basically what theta has is the amount, all, all, the, all the matrices stuck together, giving you the expected fluxes for each, uh, again, for each, the expected fluxes in each aperture that comes from each of the different sources uh, that are in the image, right? And now all we, all we need to do is implement the model. So basically, this is where you put your Bayesian hat on, and you're going to try to implement this model now. So this is how PyMC3 makes it very easy. So this is typically how you implement a model in PyMC3. This is going to be a statistical model that is going to define some sort of uh, 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 posterior from which you are going to sample. And in order to construct this posterior, as we saw in the lecture, all you need is three things. Uh, you need uh, your prior, uh, you need uh, your data, and, uh, and you need the likelihood that comes from that data. So that's exactly what we're going to be using here. So the way in which PyMC3 works, and please remember that this is something that you can do for any situation in which you have a probabilistic model with a complex or not so complex posterior from which you want to sample. Here we're doing X-ray photometry, but that doesn't need to be limited to that case. So the first thing is, which are the quantities here that you are, that you are trying to do inference on? The quantities here on which you are trying to do inference from are the S and the Bs. These are the model parameters. These are the fluxes, the rate of production of X-ray photons that you expect from the source, right? So these are your model parameters. These are therefore the ones on which you want to impose priors. If you know anything that makes you believe that the flux of a source has to be between these such and such values, then you can impose a prior on that. In this case, we're not, we're not assuming uh, much about, uh, about uh, the fluxes. We're only going to impose limits. So the flux needs to be positive. So the, the minimum value has to be zero. And then there should, there should be an upper limit. And the upper limit we set to a very conservative value that, is, that tends to be high for this region of the sky. So we, all I'm saying is I am going to assume a prior, unif a prior that is uniform. In other words, it's just a flat prior. I am going to assume before I do my experiment, before I plug in my data, my assumption is that I don't really, I don't really know much about the fluxes. I'm just going to assume that it has equal probability of being zero, of being any value between zero and 10 to the minus 12 ergs per second. Okay, so that's going to be my assumption for both the sources. And note that because I have uh, four sources in my model, uh, I have uh, I have uh, I have assigned a shape of it uh, a shape of this prior as four because I want the same prior to hold for the four sources I have, and then I have a, a prior for the background, 
And in this case, my limit, my upper limit is a little bit lower, lower because I expect my background not to be extremely bright. Uh, and in this case, it's only one because we only have one aperture region, one background region. So this is how you set priors in PyMC3. So you, all I'm saying is, okay, I'm going to build a model. The parameters of my model are going to be S, which is an array of four quantities, and B, which is a single quantity. And the priors I'm going to impose on them are this way, are uniform priors, right, uh, with certain boundaries, right? And now I'm going to write what the expected value of the outcome here is. What is the expected value of the outcome? Well, this is going to be the parameter of my Poisson distribution, right? We know that these are X-ray photons, so we know that this is going to be a Poisson process. So if you want me to go back to the slides and, 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 and uh, remember that when we look at the Poisson process, basically here, you had uh, your parameter is the expected value that you get. What, what is the actual expected value that you can expect from your experiment? And the these are the different values that the function can adopt, but the parameter here is M. So basically in this notebook, the expected values of the outcome will be the parameters, which are the expected values that I expect. And they are basically given uh, by, this, by these quantities here. So they are just uh, these sums, right? It's just a sum in, in each case. And because I have them all in the same matrix, uh, the, the background and the sources, then I can write it as a single expression where I have done, okay, take my thetas that already include the multiplication by the exposure and the PSF fractions, et cetera, and multiply it by my quantity of interest, the first one of the four, the second one of the four, third one of the four, and four one of the four, and then also have my uh, thetas for the background multiplied by my parameter B. So this is going to be the definition of those quantities. And of course, I have to do this uh, for, e each of the, for each of the 10 observations that I am considering here, right? But remember, because I, am, because I am considering them all together and my thetas are all uh, uh, a stack of all the 10 observations, this model will assume that these observations all will be fitted with a single flux, all right? So this is how you've defined your expected value of the com of the of the of the outcome. The next important part is, of course, the statistic. You want to be able to write a likelihood, right? But you can write the likelihood uh, in a very clever way by specifically defining the statistic. So if you remember in the lecture, we defined this quantity, the cash statistic, that was basically directly derived from, remember the C here was directly divided from the Poisson distribution. So saying that I am going to minimize this is the same as saying that I'm going to maximize this. So rather than writing an expression for the Poisson distribution, I can actually write an expression for the statistic itself. And this is what I'm doing here. So I am defining the cash statistic, uh, which is basically that expression that I just showed you in the slides. Uh, the uh, the uh, two sum of m minus d log m. So this is exactly what's being coded up here. Uh, and uh, and this, this quantity will be the, uh, the, the function that it will be, it will be used, that, that the algorithm will try to minimize in order to find the posterior, that, in order to sample the posterior, right? And then you just define your, your likelihood and defining your likelihood is basically saying, okay, I am going to call this the C ops. This is going to be the name of my likelihood here. And I am going to use the function I just defined as the statistic, as the, as the actual likelihood. And the observed values will be my Cs. And the Cs were just, that's, that's the, the part I, I, I failed to mention here. Here, I, on, I not only created the thetas, I also created the actual observed values, which are the quantities that you actually need when you defined your model, remember that the the remember that the uh, if you remember from the lecture here, when we define the model on which we want to do the statistic, this is the likelihood of my quantities that I want to infer on, given my observed values, and those observed values I also have to provide. So in the code here, I have also as th those values are also contained in the prep three files. 
uh, in the uh, in the in the second in the second uh, extension of the fits files, those values are contained, and I have also created an array C that contains those values. So if you see, I think I've printed C at some point. Yes, C here. These are what? These are the counts. These are the counts that I have counted coming from each source, right? In each of the apertures that I am considering. So this is basically for the 10 observations I have, the first observation has 16 counts for, sorry, the first aperture has six counts. The second aperture has three counts. The four has five, the fifth has five, and the background has 189. In the second observation of the same region, these are the, the counts, et cetera, et cetera. So I provide that to the model as the observed values. And all I have to do next is sample, sample the model. Again, the reason why I need to sample is that because in principle, my, uh, my posterior is a very complicated thing. In this case, it has how many dimensions? You cannot answer live, but many of you are thinking, of course, it's got five dimensions because these are five parameters that I'm trying to determine. Four fluxes, one, one flux for each source, and then the background level. So this has five dimensions and it can be a complicated or not, but there are situations in which we have many, many, mere, many more uh, um, uh, parameters and your posterior can be a really complicated beast. And that's why you want to use, do, to use MCMC sampling. So the best thing is that PyMC3 makes that very easy. All you have to do is, I have already defined my basic model here. This is my model with my data and my likelihood and I have my expected values of the outcome, and I am going to just sample. I am going to use, I want a thousand samples. I want you to use the, the first a thousand to tune your parameters and to make sure that uh, you are getting closer to the area where the actual probability is. Uh, this is uh, the target of acceptance rate. So this is how my, how many this will this I will discuss a little bit more in detail later. But basically, this is how often you want a particular proposal of the MCMC sampling to be accepted. And I am going to use two cores of my processor in order to in order to get this done. And all, all, all that that will do is it will uh, run the sampler. And again, this is an MCMC method based on Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It will basically be a very efficient way to sample from those posterior distributions and get the samples. And when that finishes, and it, it does it in, 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 in it, for this case, it took only 10 seconds, as you can see here, then you can plot the traces and you can plot a smoothed version of the histogram. So this, what you're seeing here is actually a histogram, but it's just being smoothed of the samples that you obtained in your MCMC sampling. Uh, for each of the quantities that you're trying to determine. So here are the four, here are the four, uh, the four sources that you had for which you had apertures. And you see that there is a very bright one. Uh, and then there's uh, three that are not so bright. And then this one down here is the background level, which you see is significantly below. This is, uh, I think the, the, the scale of this is being hidden by, by this other plot, but this is, times to times to the minus 14 x per second and this is time to the minus 18 so the background level is really really low but you see that the samples look converged so basically we are actually doing a good job at sampling the marginalized posterior distribution for each of these four quantities and this is how uh, a pymc3 uh, shows them to you and you can also uh, produce a summary of those results. If you do PM stat summary, PyMC3 will generate uh, a table with the mean, the standard deviation, uh, the percentiles, uh, 3% and 90%, 97% percentile that, that give you some idea of the error bars, what the error bars of these. Look, look, look at something interesting here. The measurement, the measurement here is coming up as some sort of distribution that is not necessarily a Gaussian and it's not necessarily symmetric. So error bars of the type plus or minus something don't really make a lot of sense here because this thing, these things don't look, uh, don't look necessarily, uh, don't look symmetric. So all you have to do is try to give to say how much probability there is between such and such point. So that's why you provide percentiles that basically tell you, you know, the 3%, uh, 3, 3 percentile will give you 
uh, basically this is the flux. This is the fl the majority of the flux. 97% of the flux is beyond this value, and uh, and 3% of the flux is uh, above this value. So it's giving you effectively is giving you this, the the error bars here, and it gives you also an R hat value that is uh, a statistic. Uh, that tells you whether the the chain has converged. So if this looks actually converged, this value will have to be very close to one. You don't want it to be uh, very far from from being one. So that's great. We've we've done we've taken some measurements of the of the uh, of the counts that we've recorded in our detector. We've applied a Poisson model to the arrival of photons. Uh, in each of those apertures. And we've created a statistical model that gives us posterior probabilities for each uh, of the different fluxes here that you've measured. So that, that's, that's exactly what we've done here. Now, the other thing is, of course, in this case, as I've said, we've, we've assumed that the sources are not variable. But if you already looked at the counts here, remember the counts, you were noticing that even though these observations are similar in time, in the amount of time they were observed, the counts are not necessarily similar, right? You see that some observations have much larger counts than others, uh, despite having similar absorption, uh, similar integration time. So perhaps what this means is that the sources are actually variable. So instead of using a single model to fit all of the observations simultaneously, you can also fit a model using each of them individually. So What's going to change is that instead of uh, instead of uh, changing, uh, instead of using all of the all of the cases, now you will use a single of the files that has been provided. So in this case, only one uh, corresponding to a single observation. So you will do the same thing. This is the same definition, but it's, this time you will only stack one observation when you create. Your, your, your matrices that contain the expected value of the outcome, you will only do it with one file. For example, observation 4703. And when you do that and run the same model again, uh, you will notice that the distributions come up differently. Look at what happens here. In this case, uh, my posterior probabilities look pretty constrained on the low uh, flux side which basically means that all we can provide for these sources in this particular observation is an upper limit. This basically what this is telling you is these sources, we cannot really, we cannot really distinguish these sources from the background and all we can give you is an upper limit based on the value of the background. Whereas if you do that with a different observation, 9555, uh, you will see that now the distribution looks like this. So it looks much kind of, they look less separated from each other uh, and uh, with respect to the single model. And what this is telling you is that these sources are all probably variable. At least certainly the blue one will be because it went from being an upper limit in a, in a, in a, uh, in a uh, observation that was, well, actually here is the only one that doesn't seem to be an upper limit. It's just squished down. But all of the other ones went from being upper limits to actually having a distribution measurable in a similar exposure time. So that probably means that these sources are being variable, uh, which means that it's probably better to do this in an individual observation and, and a basis of the individual observation rather than doing it the way we did like uh, initially, which was using all of them together. This will give you an estimate of some sort of average overall observations, but it will not give you information about uh, the actual variability in each case. All right, so it's almost 12, uh, and I wanted to leave space for maybe a couple of questions in case there is any questions about uh, what we spoke earlier this morning or, uh, or this practical part. I hope you can, you can run this. Uh, so tomorrow I will, uh, I will present to you a, uh, a lecture on uh, model fitting. So we're going to take spectra of X-ray sources and we're going to try to infer the most likely uh, physical models that explains those spectra. And I will use that as a motivation to talk about hypothesis rejection and model comparison. And I will also talk a bit more about MCMC3 and the, in the uh, MCMC methods in the particular context of, uh, of X-ray observation. So it's going to be a lesson about spectra 
and it's going to be a lesson about selecting models when you have different uh, hypotheses from which you can select. And we will do a little exercise uh, to fit spectra from Chandra using also data from the Chandra source catalog. So, Stevan, uh, if there are any questions at this point, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks, Juan. No, at this point, there are no questions right now uh, on the chat. I guess people is trying to to follow you uh, on the on the notebooks. Maybe the questions will come tomorrow when they have a, a small time to do it themselves and then try to figure out uh, if they have any questions. Okay, well, uh, I, I, I know today's lecture was particularly heavy. Uh, tomorrow's lecture will be lighter, uh, but I, I think it's important for you guys to, you know, if you're going to be doing any data science, any machine learning, these statistical concepts are extremely important. And even if you're not, if you didn't quite follow every single aspect, please feel free to drop me an email or, or ask the question tomorrow. Uh, and I'm happy to 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 answer this. There is there is no science without considering all the sources of uncertainty. There is no science before considering uh, all the all the different types of uh, you know randomness that comes into the measurements of uh, astrophysical sources. So this this is extremely important. Try to run the notebook uh, and let me know if you have any issues. And tomorrow we will continue with some more interesting exercises of on X-ray spectra. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Juan. Uh, we thank all our participants today. Uh, we leave some uh, of the most important uh, uh, web pages from Juan Rafael's uh, notebooks on the chat. And uh, please uh, follow us tomorrow because, uh, yes, as Juan said, maybe today was a little bit hard, but uh, you need to see this applied to astrophysics. And this is where you start to digest and understand and Remember that this is being recorded so you can watch Juan Rafael's uh, lecture as many times as you need in order to keep going and follow all the uh, things that he explained today. Juan, thank you very much and uh, see you thank tomorrow. You. Yep, see you tomorrow.